sure. Well, anyway, because uh, I thought there was something else in the presentation. But anyway. Oh, you done it. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I come from a small place in Germany, uh, Würzburg, and uh, I don't. Uh, I'm completely uh, new to the field of uh, MECFS. And uh, thank to the uh, Solve MECFS initiative, uh, I'm here uh, to show some of our data and to share our uh, knowledge and experience with you. Um, so, what I'm going to do today is uh, to tell you the uh, differences in concepts. So, if I tell people sitting here that the viruses, particularly herpes viruses, can contribute to the disease of MECFS. I'm sure majority of the people will not agree with me. Yeah? There are many evidences, uh, for example, people have um, shown uh, that um, different herpes viruses, parboviruses, enteroviruses, and different bacterial species has been associated with this disease over the last several decades, rather, I would say, yeah? But what is the missing point here is that we have the data of association, yeah? We only tell that these viruses, these bacteria are associated with the disease, but that there is no molecular data, though there is no study to show that how these pathogens can be linked to the disease. So my aim today is that to show you one of a unique mechanism by which herpes viruses can contribute to the disease of MECFS development. And by telling that, I will represent our data, or I will show you our data from HHP6A studies, but please do not take it granted that HHP6 is everything. Rather, I would like to show you some data that it might be possible that many other herpes viruses or many other bacteria have developed similar strategies to cause mitochondrial alterations. So, I will uh, show you the molecular characterization of infection process in MECFS. Now, I will introduce you to mitochondria, which is being elaborately discussed over the last two days. Now, we all know that mitochondria is responsible for ATP generation. It's an energy house of the cell. But there is another characteristic feature of mitochondria which is very important in the disease perspective, and that is antiviral immunity. Now, mitochondria is very puzzling to me because when I started my studies, I read that mitochondria is bin-like structures, right? But when I looked into the microscope, I never found mitochondria as a bin-like structure. So what is wrong here? Nothing is wrong. Rather, mitochondria is a network of structures, which sometimes is like beans, sometimes is elongated structures. Now look into this uh, video from our lab, um, where we target GFP or RFP proteins to the mitochondria. And here I try to focus into uh, this uh, red circle region. You can see that two mitochondria is getting separated, which is called mitochondrial fission, and the mitochondria also move towards each other and fuse. This is called mitochondrial fusion, yeah? This process is very important for the mitochondria to be healthy. The mitochondria constantly fuse with each other and get separated, and this is required for healthy mitochondria. Now, as I said, the antiviral immunity from the mitochondria is very essential. So when the mitochondria are elongated structures, they are capable of mounting the antiviral immunity very efficiently. When the mitochondria is fragmented bin-like structures, the antiviral immunity from mitochondria is decreased. Yeah? I'm not going to details of this, but this is very important for understanding why viruses can target mitochondria. I would argue that because they want to survive inside the cell, they don't want the cell to, immune, to produce the antiviral immunity. 
There are many different ways viruses targets mitochondrial immunity, but for HHV6, this is unique because we found that HHV6 induces mitochondrial fragmentation just because to stop the antiviral immunity. Now look into these pictures. So a couple of years back, we developed first ever latent HHV6A model. So what we did is that we took the HHV6, put a fluorescent molecule into HHV6 genome, and then targeted into the cell. So as you know, the HHV6 goes and integrates into the chromosome in the subtelomeric region. So when the virus is integrated, there is no fluorescent molecule being produced in the cell. The moment you reactivate the virus, the cell produces these fluorescent molecules, and then you can know where the virus is reactivating. If you look into these cells, you see that this is the solvent control here, and here is the trichostatin A treated cells, and you can clearly see that the cells which are reactivating virus, for example, three cells over here, and the cells which are not reactivating the virus has a complete different morphology of the mitochondria. This is very uh, uh, strong uh, phenotypic effect what we saw. This is in uh, bone osteosarcoma cells. Then we looked into, uh, so we developed mathematical uh, algorithms to count the mitochondria, to, uh, to measure the size of the mitochondria. So here you can see that after the uh, drug treatment, the mitochondrial uh, fragments, the number of the mitochondria increases because the mitochondria changes from longer mitochondria to smaller mitochondria. At the same time, the mitochondrial fragment size decreases because the mitochondria are smaller, yeah? So this is a quantitative measure for us to know that the mitochondria is changing its structure. This is a, a astrocyte a cell line U251, and you can see that in these cells also, so here the red doesn't mean that uh, it's a virus reactivation, rather the red is a GFAP staining to tell that these are the astroglial cells. And you can see that the mitochondria shows a similar type of phenotype. Now, you must be wondering that why mitochondria fragments? So it's already known that there are many different mechanisms by which mitochondria fragments. One of the very interesting mechanism is by a protein called DRP1. And we call it as the lord of the fission rings because this protein which is in the cytoplasm can move to the mitochondria and wraps the mitochondria and forms a ring around the mitochondria. By doing this, it squeezes the mitochondria and separates into smaller fragments, right? So we developed this uh, super resolution microscopy based approach to, uh, to um, measure each and individual rings inside the cell. We can tell that whether it's a dilated ring, whether it's a constricted ring, and we can count these rings in a non-reactivated cell versus a reactivated cell. So here, what we see is that if you look into a solvent control cells, there is DRP1, which is stained by red here, but they are in the cytoplasm, not on mitochondria. But if you look into the cell which is uh, inducing or reactivating the virus, you will see that the DRP1 rings are increased and they are forming these rings around the mitochondria. And if you do a quantitative analysis, we can also see that the uh, uh, Pearson's uh, coefficient is very strong, showing us that, yes, the DRP1 is on the mitochondria here. Now, what does it mean? So we know from the literature that there is a human RNA, which is called as microRNA 30, and this is responsible for DRP1 expression. When there is a more amount of microRNA 30, DRP1 goes down, and we have a uh, longer mitochondria. When there is a high amount of microRNA 30, DRP1 goes up, and we have a smaller fragmented mitochondria. So what we showed here is that, yes, of course, in these cells after the viral reactivation, there is a defect in microRNA 30 processing. So you can see over here that microRNA 30, the processed microRNA 30 goes down. But at the same time, we found a very interesting observation that these cells with reactivating virus are producing small non-coding RNAs from the viral genome, okay? And we found that these uh, small non-coding RNAs can actually fragment the mitochondria by themselves. I'm not going to the details of this molecular mechanism, but here to show you an example that if we take HeLa cells and produce this uh, small RNA, uh, SNRNA U14, without any other viral component, we create the same situation where the microRNA 30 is processing defect. You see the uh, the, the pre-microRNA is accumulating in the cells and you have a DRP1 upregulation, P53 upregulation, and things like that. That means that 
we don't need the whole viral component, all the proteins to have the effect. This one small RNA, which is basically a 23 nucleotide long RNA, can cause the effect. Okay. Yeah. Now, what about the mitochondrial health? We take a different approach to understand this. So here, this is a control cell. What we do is that we put a protein, which is a photoswitchable protein called MEOS2, into this mitochondria. So when we throw a laser light, the protein becomes red. Yeah? As I said, the mitochondria fuse and separate. So if the mitochondria is fusing with other mitochondria, you will see that their color is changing yeah? from red to yellow, and they are ultimately becoming green. If we do the same thing in a HHV6 A reactivated cells, even after 300 minutes or so, you see that these mitochondria are no more able to fuse with each other. Yeah? That means that there is a, a defect in mitochondrial health over here. We also looked into uh, many different other aspects, which I'm not going to say today. But just to tell you that this process also leads to uh, decreased ATP production inside these cells. And we can also show by using galactose in the culture media that not only the mitochondrial ATP, both cytoplasmic as well as mitochondrial ATP is decreased in these cells after the viral deactivation. So in summary, from our experiments or from our ex uh, experiences with HHV6 reactivation, we see that HHV react HHV6, uh, particularly A reactivation, induces alterations in mitochondrial architecture. And the cumulative effect of this is on ATP content, uh, calcium signaling, mitochondrial proteomics, many different things. Now, this is all good. And uh, with this idea, we came to solve MECFS initiative. And we wanted to check if this is the case in CFS patients, MECFS patients. So before that, I told you that I don't believe that HHB6 is the only virus which is causing this. So this is just a simple idea here. I show you that the small RNA, what I'm talking about, 23 nucleotide, has a reason of seven nucleotide, which is doing the job. Yeah? And you will see that these reasons are almost highly conserved in different herpes viruses. And I'm sure if people will look, in, look into uh, different other pathogens, probably they will also find similar type of strategy. So this might be a universal approach by many different pathogens to alter the mitochondria. Now, when we started to look into MECFS patients, we are not uh, clinicians. I'm not a clinician. I do not have the facility to uh, recruit many uh, CFS patients. I, I'm really thankful to CFS patients uh, from different parts of the Europe, uh, Germany, Poland, Austria, UK, who uh, came forward to uh, um, provide uh, different type of samples to us to analyze. So I started looking into presence of HHP6. I was really daydreaming that I will find HHP6 everywhere, and then I will say, oh, HHP6 is causing the disease. And this was not the case. As you see here, we looked into many different type of samples. We looked into hair follicle because you know that HHV6 is chromosomally integrated and inherited. We thought that we will find them, but as you see, so this is a representative picture to give you a clear idea. We looked into 23 CFS patients and uh, 12 uh, controls so far. And so you look here that uh, if we look into HHV6, we find that there is only one case out of this 10, which is having HHV6 DNA in the whole blood. In the serum, there is no HHV6 DNA or even HHV7 DNA. This is telling that there is no active infection. The, the true definition of active infection is not there. There is no viral particle formation. But if you look into the PBMCs, we find that there are two cases which is HHV6 positive, and there are uh, here five cases which is HHV7 positive, which is also the data from many labs. They have shown that they, you can detect. But this is telling us that Probably there are very specific cells in the PBMCs or in the blood which are carrying the virus. And if we take the total blood, we might be diluting this. So, um, and here is also another interesting case. For example, I have a CIA, ICI HHV6. This person has inherited the virus. So you can detect the virus in hair, whole blood, uh, serum, PBMCs. But so this is a, an ideal control for me, yeah? So um, the most interesting part, we found that the average copy number of viral DNA is only 1,000 copies in million cells. And it is very hard for me to understand how a very few infected cell can create a situation where almost every cell 
represents the disease conditions. That's what we look for in CFS patients, right, in bloods. We expect that there is a morphological change, phenotypic change in many cells. Now, uh, as I said, we found that this small non-coding RNA from the virus is an ideal biomarker because this is not expressed in latent virus conditions. And we can only find it when the virus is active. I'm not telling that the viral infection is there. Yeah? And we took a different approach. What we did is that we took uh, blood clot sections from these patients, and we did the, uh, developed a new in-situ hybridization to look for this. And we found that 40% of MECFS patients have small number of infected, HHV6A infected uh, blood cells in, uh, in the clot. We, we tested this assay using many different type of probes. For example, if you use a human U6 probe, you can find it in both type of HHV6 minus and positive cells. You take a scrambled probe, you don't detect it. And if you take a positively infected probe, you'll find in uh, the positive, infection, uh, positive infected cells. So this means that our assay is working, and we can detect more number of infected cells. Now, this, again, doesn't tell me how the virus is influencing all the other cells, which is not carrying the viral infection. Yeah? So during this time, they, we, we came across a very nice paper from uh, Flugetel, uh, from, um, uh, I think it's from Denmark or so. And it is also the idea of Professor Ron Davis also that the serum of MECFS patients have something which basically can carry the phenotype of the CFS infection to a healthy cell. So we give it a try. What we did is that we took uh, the serum from the MECFS patients and the controls and put them into healthy cells. These cells are labeled with green mitochondria, so we don't need to stain the mitochondria. We don't want to do this. And when we do this, you can see these are uh, super resolution microscopy images, and you can see the effect on mitochondria. So here is the control that I told a ICIE HHV6 person, the person having HHV6 but not reactive. And you see there is basically no difference. But if you look into the MECFS patients, the mitochondrial morphology is changed. Here I find the typical bin-like structure to mitochondria. Yeah? We quantified this, and here uh, to represent a data, you see that the first is the three controls. Here you have the average mitochondrial surface area. And if you look into the five cases over here, the mitochondrial surface area is going down. That tells us the mitochondria is fragmented in presence of the serum of MECFS patients. Now we go, went back to our cell culture system. We took the culture supernatant from the HHP6 reactivated cells, and we, do the same, we did the same experiment. And what we find is that the culture supernatant from HHP6 reactivated cells caused the exactly same morphological difference with uh, uh, fragmented mitochondria. Yeah? That means there is something similar between a MECFS condition and something similar between a viral reactivation in vitro. Now, if you are jumping into the conclusion that HHV6 reactivated cells are producing the small RNAs and the small RNA is going out and affecting the other cells, this is not the case. If you look into the, uh, uh, the parameters that we studied in the activated cells, if Yes, there is a little bit of DRP1 overexpression. There is no change in P53, at least not detectable. And there is no correlation between the DRP1 and the mitochondria. The DRP1 still in the cytoplasm, not on mitochondria. This tells us that probably there is infection going on in some of the cells, and the infected cells are somehow signaling the cells in the nearby area that something wrong going on and they also shut down the process and the mitochondria is fragmented. And the fragmented mitochondria induces a senescence, okay? This changes the metabolic profile of the cell. Now, this is one slide with which I would like to uh, probably conclude my presentation. If we think that the MECFS patient PBMCs, uh, if we take out from the blood and try to do some experiments, do they replicate what is inside the uh, uh, body? Now, this is a trivial question uh, because a couple of uh, years back, there was a paper showing that MECFS PBMCs produce high amount of ATP, yeah? 
and there are papers from other established labs beforehand that there is low amount of ATP in MECFS patients. So I was wondering what is there. So what we did here is that we took out the serum from MECFS patients. We put this serum on healthy cells for three days. Each day point, we try to look into the mitochondrial fragmentation, one day, two days, and three days. And then we removed the serum from the media, washed the cells, and then went wait for another 24 hours and then tried to look into the mitochondria. And we were shocked to see that the moment you remove the serum from the culture media, the mitochondria becomes or comes back to the normal condition. So here you can see that, I hope you can uh, see here, um, the cells with one, two, and three days treatment, their mitochondria lies in this part with the bigger mitochondria, less number. On the fourth day, the mitochondria starts to fragment drastically. So you see all the uh, cells with the smaller mitochondria on this panel. And the moment we remove the media or serum, we have the mitochondria coming back to this part again. So here's the precautionary note from my side is that don't try to come to the conclusion from cells or PBMCs from MECFS patients which is grown in artificial media. Yeah? This is something, at least from my experience, I am not sure whether this is uh, true for everything. Yeah? So what we are trying to do is that we are trying at this moment to apply a system biology approach to look into many different possibilities. We have a hypothesis that probably the fragmented mitochondria, you know that uh, the extracellular vesicles, small exosomal vesicles, they are produced from the outer surface of the mitochondria. And when the mitochondria are fragmented, the number of these vesicles changes. And this is well established in Parkinson's and many other type of diseases. So we're trying to see if something is induced by this mitochondrial change, which is transferring the phenotype to the other cells. But we may be wrong here. It might be simply ROS, the high amount of ROS produced from the fragmented mitochondria. We know that it does. It might be small RNAs or anything. We heard about talk from uh, circulating microRNAs, and we have already published the data, the microRNA profile for, uh, from HHV6 reactivated cells changes. It might be uh, some cytokines, some proteins, so we still do not know. So what we do is that we try to look into single cell approach. We try to uh, fuse metabolic labeling into single cells and try to see what amount of new RNA are produced in these cells. We, try, we want to take it to uh, CFS PBMCs, so we want to do this in PBMCs and see what type of RNA are synthesized from these cells. But yeah, of course, um, funding is always a problem for this type of uh, system biology work. Uh, this is a small lab of mine uh, with four to five people, um, but uh, very talented uh, uh, PhD uh, scholars and uh, master students and bachelor students. And uh, we also um, uh, get collaborations from uh, many different people, including uh, Markus Sauer, who is a, the pioneer in super-resolution microscopy. Um, we are supported by many other people, collaborations, and also grants from unusual sources like Volkswagen Stiftung, uh, HSV6 Foundation, Solp MECFS Initiative, and we have a very, very renowned center in our place called Helmholtz Institute for RNA-based infection research and uh, we are also funded by uh, that. So with this, I would like to um, end my talk. Um, I would be happy to ask a couple of questions if I have, yeah. Yeah, I think you can probably do a couple. Yeah. Thank you, Bupesh, that was great. I hope you all enjoyed that presentation. We can probably do about two questions in the room, and then if anyone has any follow-up questions, feel free to find Bupesh afterwards. So let's start here. That was a great presentation, uh, Bupesh, uh, great work. In the six nucleotide sequence that you presented, the yep. G, A, G, C, U, C, the, the common, uh, the cytosine, uracil, cytosine sequence is the one that is common to all the herpes viruses. <clears throat> Do you think the primary effect is coming from that, those three nucleotides? Yes, so um, I did not present uh, the data over here, so what we can show is that these six nucleotides are the reason which goes and binds to the uh, stem loop of pre-microRNA. 
and thereby it prevents the Drosa Dicer complex to cut the pre-microRNAs and produce the processing microRNAs. This is a very typical example of RNA-RNA interactions and how pathogens can modulate the host cell just producing small RNAs. Yeah. Okay, please go ahead. Yes. As you're aware, when CFS cells are stressed with saline in solution, their impedance changes. Yeah. Yes? Do you think that the mitochondrial model might explain some of what's going on there? So as I said, um, we have some idea that what exactly causes the mitochondrial changes. But as I said that we clearly saw that there is something in the serum, some signaling molecule or something, which is signaling the healthy cells to shut down their mitochondria, right? And if we take out the uh, cells and uh, grow them in a different conditions with a different type of stress, probably the physiology will change. So, um, yeah, I agree that um, one has to be very careful when coming to any conclusion what these cells are doing 